Hello and welcome, my name is Meepolis and this is Literally Graphic. And today we are talking about another anthology of stories by and about different First Nations, Métis, and Inuit peoples of Turtle Island, opened with a foreword by Alicia Elliott, a Haudenosaunee woman and author of A Mind Spread Out on the Ground that I recently listened to and cannot recommend highly enough. It's very much a set of stories about the post-apocalyptic reality of that Turtle Island, First Nations, Métis, and Inuit people have been in since contact with Europeans. And because of this past year's ongoing solidarity with the Wet'suwet'en, I am embarrassingly aware of just how crap at pronouncing things I am, so in order to attempt to do this review justice, I have located various YouTube videos where hopefully reliable people are pronouncing things. I will use these to practice and will link below for people to check out for themselves, although some names I could not find reliable looking pronunciations of, which is denoted by the lack of URL after the name. Suggestions are welcome. First up, we have Annie of Red River, a story about a Métis woman whose actions inspired Louis Riel, profiled here by the illustrious Métis author Catherine Vermette, whose debut novel, The Break, I would also highly recommend. Each of the stories is introduced by a few paragraphs by the author themselves and a short timeline of other events that surround each story, giving the reader a context for what is to come. This short story was illustrated by the very prolific Scott B. Henderson and was colored by Donovan Yashik. The only thing that brought me up short about this story is that the event that is at the center, Annie whipping a white racist misogynist who published his vitriol in the Toronto Globe, and yet while the illustration seems to be trying for an angle where you wouldn't see his back after, there should at least have been some frayed edges showing. I guess they didn't want to be graphic at all, but it doesn't really make any sense. Tilted Ground, on the other hand, is an ever so slightly more abstract looking story about the author's great-grandfather, Chief Billy Asu, and the colonization of the western side of so-called Canada, written by Sunny Asu, with illustrations by Kyle Charles and Scott A. Ford. The highlight of this comic was probably, among other things, because I'm shit at picking favorites, the frames of John A. Macdonald, first prime minister of so-called Canada, being his alcoholic self, because this is an image that needs to be emblazoned on the minds of every last colonizer. The third story, Red Clouds, is a semi-fictionalized retelling of stories related to Windigo. Our main character is a composite, and shows a lot of interesting angles on the before-mentioned apocalypse on Turtle Island as the colonizers continue to take more and more. This one is written by Jen Storm, who did another short comic with Scott B. Henderson that I should read, with illustrations and color by Natasha Donovan. Peggy is a story by David A. Robertson whose books I should be re-reviewing soon, with illustrations and colors by Natasha Donovan. The story itself is about one of the most effective snipers in history, who was conscripted into World War I, despite not really being a full citizen, and then shafted by so-called Canada like every other Indigenous veteran. He went on to be involved with a lot of pro-Indigenous politics, but the story itself mostly focuses on his time of service, so steer clear if you are sensitive to that sort of thing. The fifth story, Rosie, by Rachel and Sean Kitsurkinsley, outlines some of the unique difficulties of the Inuit assimilation process. The illustrations for this one were very expressive, with minimalistic color washes by G.M.B. Chamachuk. Nimki, by Kataryakuwenzi Dam uses the stories of several specific indigenous children taken into care to illustrate the widespread and well-known abuses that plagued the system of child services across so-called Canada. It's not just a story of hardship, but also of resilience and active resistance, with illustrations by Ryan Howe and Jen Storm, colors by Donovan Yashik. The seventh story, Like a Razor Slash by Richard Van Camp, another prolific creator I need to re-review, covers the highly effective speech of Chief Frank Tessley, 
against the Mackenzie Valley Pipeline, an event followed by 1,000 other testimonials that Van Camp believes set the stage for Idle No More and all the subsequent Indigenous-centered anti-pipeline protest. This piece is once again illustrated by Scott B. Henderson, with colors by Scott A. Ford. Turning the corner to the last three stories, Miguedetam, We Remember It, by Brendan Mitchell tells the story of a military raid on Listiguch exercising their treaty rights to fishing. Brandon talks about a few in their introduction, including the one covered by the beautiful documentary by Elinus Obamsawin, entitled Restiguch, which I highly recommend. And I'm not sure exactly which one this was, but knowing it happened more than once only makes the whole thing that much more outrageous, illustrated by Tara Audibert and colors by Donovan Takiuk. Second to last, Warrior Nation by Nigan Wewenden James Sinclair is a condensed version of his own experience coming into the Oka crisis, the subject of another excellent Alanis Obamsawin documentary that is also a classic coming of age story. Kataskanau 2350 by Chelsea Val, one of the co-creators of Métis in Space, a pod that I, you guessed it, could not more highly recommend, is a look at what has happened, what is happening, and looks forward to an indigenous future where Turtle Island has been decolonized. A story with many dark points, but like this anthology overall full of healing and the potentiality for hope. While this anthology does not include a related reading list, they more than made up for it by including actual citations, which I think is really coolio, since I like the idea of taking comics seriously and showing receipts. Reviewing the bios of all the contributors, I would estimate that at least 75% of them obviously identified as being indigenous to Turtle Island, with only a few artists, colorists not identifying as such. The publisher Highwater Press is an imprint of Portage and Maine that is specifically geared to letting indigenous people of Turtle Island tell their own stories via children's books, graphic novels, and YA novels slash nonfiction speaking generally. Publishing jargon is not exactly my forte. I have read a wide selection of their children's books and graphic novel collection, many of them I need to repost. As you've probably noticed, I've been on a run of finally getting to a lot of reviews that I have been procrastinating on due to feeling links, so I apologize if I missed something, but if I remember correctly, while there isn't really anything done with diverse sexuality, there is a pretty good spread of characters who fall on both sides of the quote classic gender binary, which is something for you. I feel like disability slash ability is not really a thing, although race and class are kind of in many ways intrinsic to the indigenous struggle across Turtle Island because we live in a white supremacist world. Bye y'all, keep reading, and resist white supremacy. And as always, Literally Graphic is recorded on the traditional territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation and Anishinaabe people, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Huron Wendat Nation. I live here because of British colonization, indigenous genocide, and more geographically specific, Treaty 13, also known as the Toronto Purchase, which was finalized in 1805 between representatives of the Crown and certain Mississauga peoples. This treaty was a lie and has since been broken many times over. Saying so reflects only my own small steps towards knowing the truth and does nothing for reconciliation.